trust in God. Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. He died and rose again and set me free. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce. I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm really thrilled to be with you. I'm in the book of Colossians, and I mean more than any of the other books. I always say this about every one of them, though. I love this one. It's just loaded with truth, loaded with great spiritual food. Good food for eat, for us to eat, you know. Uh, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And, and basically, that's what these little letters to the churches, to Ephesus and Galatian, Galatia and Colossae. This is, to, this is a little city, Colossae. It's in Turkey, in today's Turkey. And um, it's uh, about 100 miles east of uh, Ephesus. So these are little cities that Paul, uh, in these cities uh, is where the, the gospel was established. These little churches were established. And Paul had not ever been to this city, but you know there had been m many people that had heard the gospel preached by Paul and then returned to their own place and then witnessed to their people and, and formed these little churches. Well, it doesn't take long for a church to be uh, formed that the devil doesn't come in to try to pervert everything. And, and Colossians is no exception. I mean, that um, it, it, has, it had already been bombarded with some heretical teachings about Jesus. And I mean, if you're going to have heretical teachings, let it not be about Jesus. But it was. It was. They, you know, did not really, they were not holding Jesus up as the preeminent one, the head of the, of the church. The second person of the Trinity could have been, could have slipped into um, uh, Antichrist spirit. So, um, you know, this was pretty dangerous. It was pretty uh, strong, and they did have an intercessor. They had some faithful saints there, but within this church, there was always this evil beginning to work within the people, and a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. So Paul is writing this letter to clear up some problems, and that was one of them, that Christ was not the second person of the Trinity, and um, they thought of him as a top angel, and which absolutely, you know, a top angel could not come and redeem mankind, so he wouldn't have been the savior of the world if that were the case. So Paul has to re, uh, um, re retell the framework or the foundational truths again to uh, this little church. And I think it's always expedient for every fellowship, every church, every home group, however you meet together um, as a fellowship to really reestablish yourself some often in the foundational, fundamental teachings, the foundational teachings of the gospel. And it's because Paul says it's by the gospel that we stand. It's, that's our stand. And that's our hope. Actually, he says in Colossians, in verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherewith ye heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. Well, what's the truth of the gospel? Well, last time we just, we talked about verses 20 through 23, which really brings out the truth of the gospel, uh, that we're blood-bought, that were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. No animal sacrifices could never really take away the sins of the world. And uh, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And the sin of the world really is um, that, that the devil has invaded humanity and is actually expressing his evil fruit through us, which are, which are really sins. The Bible says that. And that's pretty strong. Most people can't take that, but yet, oh, what are we going to do? Say the Bible's uh, uh, not telling us the truth? Because Paul said, and I think most of us don't realize how far we have fallen because we've been weak in teaching the truth of the gospel. And the truth is we are fallen and hopelessly without hope, without a Savior, without an intercessor, without 
a, a, a perfect man, the man Christ Jesus, come in history and pay the price for our redemption to redeem us back to God because we were all stolen away by the devil. You know, we in America are pretty intellectual and pretty well, um, uh, our minds are, are it, 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 it kind of stuns our intellectual minds to even think that the devil is operating mankind apart from Christ. Well, you know, I've been to Africa, I've been to France, I've been to England, I've been a lot of places in Europe, I've been a lot of place in, places in the world. And, but when I go to Africa and I teach who we were before we were saved, it's well received there. I mean, why? Because they know that the devil, <laughs> the devil uh, is operating people that are not saved. He, they know that the devil has been operating them that are not saved. But yet we Americans are so intellectual that it stuns our intellectual minds to even consider such a thing. But if not considering it, we're not really even knowing the fullness of the gospel. The mighty power of the resurrection of Christ coming out of the grave, paying the price for our sins, for the sins that we committed. Now, a lot of people say, well, if you say the devil was in people, then he was making them do all the sins and they had no response. We had no responsibility. Oh, yes, we do. The devil lies to us. He makes, it, makes us think it's really us. So basically, as far as we know, we're the ones that love our own pride. We're the ones that are built up in our own self-justification that love to justify our actions, whether they look good or whether they look evil. The world lives on self-justification. If you're still living on self-justification, justifying your actions, and, and making them somehow right, maybe not even thinking about being right before God, but right to yourself. You see, you've become your own God. Self has become God. And that's really the devil. That's really the devil in you. It really is. And you need to be born again of the Spirit of God that can make you into a new creation, then, then can recreate you into a new being, a new, whole new being. That's what the gospel is about. Now, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for your sins. And through his body death, we have a replaced nature. So Satan is out and Jesus is in. And you see, the cross really is an exchange of gods. We have the God of this world living in us. Now, well, I mean, people would just want to stone me when I say that. <laughs> I've had people that upset with me, and Christians. However, you know, all I can do is give you the scriptures, and either you're going to disagree or agree with God. And if you disagree, then you go, go on with your own opinions. But your own opinions will not hold water when you face God. You're going to have to, be fa you're gonna, you're gonna have to face Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. And what you do with what he has done with you is the only thing that's going to count. So the last program, I gave, I gave the gospel the truth of what happened, what God did to redeem mankind. Now, do, Jesus did it all, but it's, it's not going to be yours unless you receive it. What is your part? What is the human, what's the human's part? Well, if you've heard me teach very long, you've, you know that I'm saying that the human's part is simply what the human being is. What is the human being? Well, the Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians that we're an earthen vessel, that we're a vessel. What, all can, a, what can a vessel do? A vessel, all a vessel can do is receive a content, you see. Well, the vessel has no power of its own, but it's got to be humble enough to take it that Jesus has to become my life. Because me living my own life is really, you're in the devil's camp. You're going to be living for yourself. It's going to be a self for self for self life. Uh, and you, you might be, it might look pretty good. It might look pretty religious. The Pharisees did too. They looked pretty good. They looked, they were the most re religious people of the, of the day. But you know what Jesus said of them? Let me read you exactly what Jesus said to them in John chapter 14. 
uh, no, John chapter 8. Let me, let me find John here. Chapter 8, because I wanted to read to you. This is what Jesus said in verse 44. He says, you Pharisees are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you, you will do. All right, what, what does that mean? The lust of your father you will do. See, they weren't even doing their own desires. They were doing the will of the devil who lived inside them. It proves exactly what I'm saying. The scripture says this. They were the most religious people of their day. And yet this is what Jesus said. And then he said, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, he apostatized into the lie. He makes the lie truth. And the lie has permeated the earth. The devil's lie has permeated the earth and people take it as the truth. That's what, it, what happens. Because there is no truth in him. <laughs> For when he, when, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. He's the father of lies. Jesus is the father of truth. He's the father of truth. Jesus is the only hope of salvation, of returning to God. We've been broken away at the at the fall of Adam. All humanity has been broken away, has fallen away, fallen short. All have sinned. You can't justify yourself before God. You can't say, well, I was a pretty good person or I went to church a lot in my life. You can't come up with any of those excuses. There will be no bragging rights in heaven. When you face the Lord, all you can face him with is the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm depending on that with all my heart. It cleanses me from all sin. And through your body death, Jesus, you gave me a new nature, and I'm depending on that new nature within me to make me a new creation. And that's, that's, the, only, that's the only way that we can face God. When we do, each one of us will face God. And you'll not be able to face Him with one thing you've done apart from the Spirit of God doing it and expressing His righteous fruit through you. So there is no other way. There's no other hope. We always say on the liberating secret, Christ in you, the only hope of glory. And it is the only hope. What I want to do is read today, before I go, go on into um, the next part of the scriptures, I want to read today something I wrote a long time ago. I thought it was pretty good. Um, it, the name of it is, What the gospel is not or what Christianity is not. I think sometimes we can see things by comparison. If we have a, a, a real dark and light, I mean you can see things by comparison. So let's look at some of the, some of the ways that we're not saved or we're, we're, it's not Christianity or it's not the gospel. The first one I say is, it is not Jesus knowing, saying, I believe in Jesus, plus my own good works. It is not. It's not. That's what Paul calls a false gospel. That's what Paul calls a perverted gospel because it's mixed with good works. When you come, when you surrender your heart to Jesus, you cannot come with any goodness of your own whatsoever. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's all of Jesus and no of you. <laughs> really, somebody says it's a death sentence to you, and that's the truth. When I wrote my book, The Treasures of Darkness, I put a phrase in there that uh, some, of, some of the people in my fellowship use this phrase, that Christ expresses himself as us. Wow, well, that's pretty strong to say. Well, if he's in you, He's going to live his life out through you. And I always say, who else is he going to live it as but as you? It's not really you, but it comes out as if it's you. He expresses his good works as if it's you, his righteousness as if it's you. So therefore, I can say I am righteous because I'm one with the righteous one. Okay. 
But I, in my book, somebody read that and they threw my book as far as they could across the room. Christ as me? That can't be true. Then this person picked it back up again and he says, oh my gosh, if it's Christ as me, then somebody's got to go. And it's not Christ. It's going to have to be me. <laughs> and that's the truth. It's Christ plus nothing. It's just the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ has done all the work. And the vessel just simply receives it by faith. Okay, and there's a verse that says that in Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. We have to come to God and cry out for mercy. Give me mercy, Lord. Is there mercy at the cross for me? You see, we have to see. If we could only see, you know, what God sees and why Jesus had to pay the price for our salvation, because God knows what the devil has done in humanity. And he knows that the deception that we live in. And he knows that our hearts and minds are blinded and our hearts are desperately wicked. We don't know it. That's the problem. So it's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict us that our hearts are desperately wicked. Now, should I say that after I become born again? See, that's, that's, that's confusing to some born again people. Because if you are a born again, blood bart Christian, if that's who you are, certainly you do not say your heart is desperately wicked because Ezekiel says he's given you a new heart a new spirit and put his spirit within your heart and caused you to walk in his ways. It's a whole different story to the person that's born again. But that person who is not born again, the Bible says that your heart is desperately wicked. All the self-justification that you can muster up is nothing but wickedness. That's all it is. It's the devil's answer to God. <laughs> the devil is still trying to justify himself before God. Can you believe it? Second thing is, Christianity or the gospel is not keeping the Christian laws or the Jewish law. It's not even keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not, it's, not, it's not about me doing good works or keeping the Ten Commandments or being a moral person and therefore God is going to see how moral I've been and how good I've been and therefore I can become a Christian. That's, that's the lie. That's the desperation of our heart and the wickedness of our hearts speaking that out. Now, let me tell you, my husband had a brother came to our house. He knows what we teach. He knows what we say. And he said one day when we were eating dinner with him, well, I've got a lot of friends and they're pretty good. They do good things. They're not so bad. They don't do drugs. They don't rob banks or they don't do anything like that. And you know, God's, God's they're all gonna go to heaven. Well, my husband said that my, his brother knew that he was going to flip my switch, and he did flip my switch, and I certainly did preach the gospel to him. And he finally said, Sylvia, this is enough. And I stopped just like that. And I hugged him, and I said, you know what, Bill? I do love you, but I, if I love you, I must tell you the truth. He says, Sylvia, I do know that you love me, and I knew that you would tell me the truth. So I think he said that in order to get to hear it one more time what the truth really was, and we believe that. So Christianity is not a religion. It's not being religious. It's not, um, uh, because the word religion in the Greek uh, is religama, religama, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right. And that word means to bind up, attach, and to tie up. <laughs> so I think religion, you know, has been so misused. There is a time in James when, when that word is brought up, but it's brought up in a different way than to bind up and to uh, tie up. You see, the religious spirit wants to just bind you up in one law after another. One thing after another you have to do to be right with God. We don't have to do, we don't have to, we come to God as a hopeless sinner. When, when you uh, are ready to take a bath, do you clean yourself up before you get in the bathtub? How silly. Well, you don't clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You come dirty. You come needing salvation. You come full of sins. And His blood washes away all your sins. How about that? 
And Christianity is not a mental ascent. It's not something that you know in your mind, it, that you've memorized, or you've thought you've known, you think you know. Usually, when you ask a person, do you know that you're, uh, if you would die today, you'd be, you'd be going to heaven? They'd say, well, I think so. If they think, think so, they've just had a mental ascent. They don't know. When you know that you know that you know, the Holy Spirit has witnessed that in your heart. Now, that makes a difference. I mean, the Bible says you believe with your heart and mouth is, and with your mouth you speak it as your confession of faith, your profession of faith, you see? So it's not about your head. Everybody wants to come intellectually because they know, even knowing the scriptures, they know about Christianity. They know everything there is to know intellectually. You, your intellectual mind is blinded by the devil. I can tell you that blinded to the spiritual truths that God wants you to know. So we don't come by, by our minds or by how much we know or how much we've memorized or which church we've, we've gone to or how good we are or how moral we are or even how bad we are. <laughs> Some people are just proud of their sins, even trying to justify their sins, you see. <laughs> we don't come that way. You don't... Um, uh, it doesn't come by mental assent. Uh, it is not trying to your best to be a good person. That is not Christianity. It is not being baptized with water. Being baptized with water is a wonder, wonderful symbol of, your, of the cross, of death, burial, and resurrection. And it symbolizes what you're receiving because you've received the gospel. That's the gospel that will save you is because you've believed that Jesus died for you, was buried, and was raised from the dead. But the water itself will not save you. I always say if water can save you, we ought to fall down and worship it. That's silly, but that's the truth. Christianity is not belonging to a denomination, any kind of denomination. I mean, as good as maybe your denomination might be, or as bad as your denomination might be, denomination will never save you. It is not walking down an aisle and signing a card. So many people say, well, when I was five years old, I walked down and signed a card, and they lived like the devil the rest of their life. That is not salvation. Salvation is a whole surrender of your whole life, your whole heart, your whole mind, and loving the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your will. You see, it's coming to the cross and knowing that you, you died on the cross with Christ. You died with him. And you don't live any longer, that he's the one that lives inside you. That's Christianity. It's not, Christianity is not being born in the USA. I mean, God bless America. But America, just because there are some Christians in America, does not make America a Christian country. Just because there were some faith people in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family apart from his wife, did not make Sodom and Gomorrah a faith-based city. So, you see, just because there are some Christians here, and you, so you're not a Christian just because you live in this country. You're not, a, you're not a Christian. Christianity is not a social program or a social reform. We're always trying to reform ourselves. You see, it's not, you're not, you're not believing in the Holy Spirit's transformation when you're trying to in, reform yourself. It is, not God, it is not God helps those who helps themselves. It is not keeping the golden rule. It is not God helping us be a good person. He doesn't help us be a good person. He comes inside of us. You can't be a good person. If you're still trying to be a good person, you haven't heard the fullness of the gospel. You died and another is taking your place and that's Jesus. And he lives out the righteousness by you and through you. It is not God helping us to overcome evil. It is not Jesus walking alongside me. It's Jesus in me is the only hope of glory. It is not performance-based acceptance. We're not accepted by God because we've got a good outer performance. It is not tithing any money to be blessed instead of cursed. Now, uh, people don't say you're uh, going to be cursed. The Bible says that we have all the blessings in Christ Jesus. It's not about just tithing. That might be a good thing to do, but that does not save you. 
It's not based on conditions like I can do, do, do in order to be blessed. It is not self-improvement. It is not self-effort. It is not self-generated righteousness. And it is not self-activity based on self-sufficiency. That's it. It has nothing to do with you other than you as a simple person that agrees with God. I'm lost in my trespasses and sins before God. I'm unholy, and I need you, Lord. I need you, Jesus. And by faith, see, salvation is hard and it's easy at the same time. It's hard because you might have to look at yourself and agree with God that you're dead in trespasses and sins. It's, hard, it's easy because all you have to do is humble yourself before God and say, thank you, Lord. I'm going to take your blood, and I'm going to know that your blood cleanses me from all my sins. And you teach me your ways. You teach me what it means to live inside me. And you be my teacher. You, my Lord, you're my teacher, and I receive you by faith. That's salvation. That's salvation. And God knows how to take that heart and mold it and teach you and train you how to walk in the ways of God. So that's what we preach and teach on The Liberating Secret. That is liberation. That's the beginning of how you can know your liberation in Christ. First, that your sins are forgiven, and then you can know you're a new creation in Christ. So thank you for joining me, and may God richly bless you. Goodbye. You have been listening to The Liberating Secret with Sylvia Pierce. We want to send a special thank you to all our supporters who make this program possible. If you have been blessed by this program and would like to contact Sylvia, you can write her at P.O. Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. That's Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. You can also find more of Sylvia's teachings on her website. The web address is www.theliberatingsecret.com. That's www.theliberatingsecret.com. And be sure to listen again right here Monday through Friday at the same time for The Liberating Secret with author and teacher Sylvia Pierce. So until next time, may God richly bless you.